right. Good afternoon, everyone. It is six o'clock on the dot, actually it's 6.02. And we are going to get started with this session of the Bahamas Project Management Community with Dr. Larry Davis, who is joining us from Texas today, talking about blockchain and uses beyond Bitcoin. And so what we're going to start off with first is giving honor and reverence to God. I um, am a stickler for my religion and it goes with me wherever I go and I have to give my Lord his reverence because it's through him that everything is accomplished and his will is being done through this Bahamas Project Management Community. And I must confess that I've been having challenges lately and having to rely more and trust him more and just be still and wait on his guidance. So let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this and every opportunity that we can come before you on this platform as a Bahamas Project Management Community. We know that we are still in the infancy stage there, God, but we know that this is your will, this is your purpose. And whatever we do here is to bring honor and glory to your name. We ask, Lord, that you would guide our steps, that you would give us the wisdom, the knowledge, and the understanding to be patient and to wait on your will, dear God, to not look at what's going on in the world and become frustrated and annoyed and feel that we have to make things happen in our time. Let us know that it is your perfect timing that we should be patient on and that you would give us the grace and mercy and understanding to know that nothing happens before your time that this community will grow when you want it to grow, that you will send us who you want us to be in connections with, that you will make those divine connections there, God. We know that once we put our trust in you, that we have nothing to fear. You provide for the birds of the air. And so we are your children there, God. And we know that you will provide all of our needs. You will meet every expense that we incur. And we know that all we have to do is trust and obey. And Father God, I ask that you would Touch me, especially, Lord, as the leader of this Bahamas Project Management Community, that you would give me a sense of peace and, the, and a purpose there, Father God, that I will continue to do your will and only your will, that you will strip me of my carnal flesh, that I will follow your lead, and that only you and you alone will get the glory. When miracles happen there, God, it'll not be because Andre did something. It'll be because God made it happen. And Lord, I thank you for everything that you have done and everything that you are about to do. And I ask you to, for your continued grace and blessings on this community and everyone who is involved and everyone who we can touch through this platform. In Jesus' holy name, I pray. Amen. Amen. So, he had to deal with me today. So, <laughs> so um, Dr. Larry Davis, I did not bring up your biography. I have the, everything else open up except that. And I would love to read it That's if okay. I can find it. <laughs> so give me one second. Okay, there you go. Thank okay, you. so Dr. Larry Davis is a co-founder of exchange.io. He holds a bachelor's degree from Florida A&M University and a master's degree and PhD from the University of Central Florida all in electrical engineering. His area of expertise include artificial intelligence, software engineering, cloud configuration and administration, and virtual and augmented reality. Dr. Davis has, co -found, has founded or co-founded six technology companies, three of which he received external investment. He has led or contributed in all areas of the technology development pipeline from research to product deployment. He holds a patent in augmented reality that is licensed externally. Dr. Davis and his wife of 25 years live in Plano, Texas and have two teenage children. When not working, you can find him on chess.com or injuring himself in one of several athletic pursuits while attempting to recapture past glory. That's an impressive bio, Dr. Davis. Well, uh, thank you, Andrea. I, I appreciate it. Um, and uh, my wife has definitely curtailed me from trying to recapture past glory recently. Uh, that in an old age. <laughs> well, I, I can halfway agree with you with the old age thing. I've started to, to creak a little 
just a little. <laughs> and stuff just popped, you know. So it happens. <laughs> Keep living, uh, you will get older. I know, right? <laughs> But God willing, we will be having this conversation for many years to come. <laughs> yes, indeed. But just to give just to give persons a few more minutes before you start your presentation, let me do quickly um, a, a run through my, a, okay a run through of our website. I wanted to just share some updates that we did, and persons may not be too familiar with the website and act and what all they offer because they just go on the events page and once they see that event pop up, they don't really bother to look and see what else is going on. But I always like to celebrate learning and I congratulate the persons who recently completed the certified Scrum Master certification. I did send out a congratulation message in our group, but I would also like to acknowledge them again and keep acknowledging them every chance I get. <laughs> Good evening, I love it. Colin. I love it. It's scrum masters. We, we, yes. we need more. Totally. Yes. And they are, <laughs> of, they are very few in the Bahamas. And so that's why I keep celebrating them and telling them how proud I am of their accomplishments. So let me share my screen. I have so much screens up. I don't know which one I want to click on. Okay. I think that's the one. Yes. Can you see my screen? Okay, great. So this is the video for this congratulating the certified scrum masters. And let me play it. You know what I didn't share with audio. Let me go back. I don't know why they have that little button there. That is, you know, like share sound. Nobody remembers that little button. Somebody need to make um, I'm Zoom aware that that button is too small to remember. So here you go. Can you hear it? Hi, I'm Melissa Darvel, an entrepreneur and an educator, and I am so excited to have passed my certification as a Scrum Master. Being a Scrum Master is all about being a servant leader. As a Scrum Master, your job is to work with a team of competent individuals in order to accomplish a complex task. And what you do is you break that complex task into small sprints, one or two week intervals, where you can accomplish small goals in order to reach your larger goal. And my intention is to use the skills that I've learned as a Scrum Master in order to improve my current businesses and to help build Bahamian brands. Hey, good day. My name is Kenny Mackey. I would have recently received my Certified Scrum Master certification um, through Creative Minds. Uh, it was a very good experience. I loved the course, very interactive. Uh, from it, I was able to get a better understanding of Agile methodology, uh, more specifically Scrum. Um, for those who might not know, um, Scrum is basically a approach in which you can deal with complex matters or basically work more efficiently in a changing environment. Um, to bring it home as we're going now through this pandemic, of course things constantly changing, the world today isn't the world tomorrow. Um, so realize it's very practical, especially now what we're going through um, and definitely plan to implement and use it moving forward even more. So thanks Creative Minds. Uh, and hope to see you to the next one. Hi, you could imagine putting yourself in a situation that you could advance and enhance a certification or a knowledge base that you have. That is what I went through recently with the help of Creative Minds and Transformational Experts. I was able to attain my CSM, which is my Certified Scrum Master. You don't know what this has done for me. It has improved and it has actually helped me to move forward, to scale up my project management knowledge into an agile base. And not only that, but it is now assisting me to move forward in my professional life and my personal life because I am now able to break it down to 
adjust, to adapt, to, and to have a different way of leadership, which is big for me, especially in my speaking life, not only my project management life. I'm so grateful. I'm so happy. What are you waiting for? Okay, so that was our congratulatory message for those who would have passed their, their CSM certification. We actually had eight persons that actually took that course. And so we're just awaiting the other five to sit their exam and pass it. I, I don't know what they're waiting on, but I think it's just, you know, the fear of the unknown. They think it's a complex exam. And I'm telling them, no, guys, you know, just do it. You know, I did it in 20 minutes. And you know, they was like, no, but Andrea, you, you, you're different. We can't, you can't compare yourself to us because what you could finish in 20 minutes, we'll need two hours, but it's not that complicated. And I really enjoy being a certified scrum master. And hopefully in another meetup, I will share my journey with working with my scrum team in South Florida and, and the project that we're working on. I will actually probably plan a meetup early next year to discuss that. Actually, we have a presentation on the 15th of September that we are going to be presenting our agile journey with the product that we developed. It's a mobile app for scrum masters and, and coaches. So it's to help persons who are scrum masters to be able to use that app to have all of the different artifacts and the, the different events that go along with scrum. We developed an app and I was a part of that team, remote team based in South Florida, but we actually have persons who are in New Jersey, some of them are in South Florida, some is some are in Texas. So it's a, it's a team that's all over the world, but we, we come together remotely and we develop that app. So on the 15th of September, I'll be sending an invitation to our group to let you guys know how to join us and celebrate, you know, Bahamians doing good things with a remote team. So that's as much as I'm gonna say about that. Um, I have one more quick thing to show and, and then I'm going to hand the reins over to Dr. Larry Davis. Just bear with me one more second while I share my screen again. Sandra, while you're sharing your screen, yeah, please make sure you let me know how you went through that CSM in 20 minutes because it took me a lot longer than that when I went through it. <laughs> Why? I mean, I, no, let me tell you. I, I'll tell you. That was my last certification I was trying to accomplish last year. And it was, it was New Year's Eve, December 31st. And I sat down and I told my husband, I said, listen, I don't want to take this into the new year. I'm going to take my computer in the room. It was like 1130 <laughs> that night. And I said, I'm going to take this computer in the room and I'm not coming over here until I'm a certified scrub master. And 20 minutes later, he said, what happened? You know, the computer went down. Something happened. Why are you out the room? I said, I'm done. <laughs> I, I was done you know it was it was I think it was just that determination to get it done and I actually got yeah. I got 48 questions right out of 50 so those two questions they wow. still bother me today like what was the answer but I had to let that one go okay so you can't can follow me up because I am a bookworm so don't mind me don't mind that 20 minutes take as much time mm -hmm. as you need to study for your CSM certification exam Clearly. Don't follow me. <laughs> All righty. <laughs> we'll have to compare notes with Kenny because he's on the call too. <laughs> yeah. But it should have been easy for Kenny too because Kenny is part of the scrum team in South Florida. So he has the practical experience, not just the theory. So that helps. So Indeed. what am I trying to share? I'm getting lost again. Okay, events. This is what I want to share. Everyone can see my screen, right? Okay, I wanna share with you guys that my team and I have been working very hard to put together our meetups for the rest of the year. This is actually the rest of our meetups for 2021. After December 9th, we go on vacation for the rest of the year. I'm going on vacation, so please do not call me. <laughs> Just putting that note in there. I will be on vacation and I will not be doing any business related work. I will be with my family in Georgia and trying to be MIA. So after December night, we close down and then we start up again in January. But I want to bring to your attention our only paid event 
This is our only time we're asking for you to please support the Bahamas Project Management Community. This is our Let's Talk project featuring myself, Sophia Walker, and John Michael Clark, Bahamian project managers, and we're asking for a small investment of just $25. Now, this $25, we're expecting this to be like the five loaves of bread and two fishes kind of scenario, where we're only asking you for this small amount, but we need this to be magnified like 20 times to run this community, but we don't want to put that burden on the community itself. And so we're just asking you to invest $25 to go towards the operations of the Bahamas Project Management Community, which needs funding. Creative Minds has been funding the community from day one, but now funding has to be redirected to another project. And so the community has to now stand on its own two feet and come up with funding and come up with corporate investors or sponsors. So we, we're gonna have to be doing some work on that end as far as how we're going to fund to continue what we're doing. I think we're doing an amazing job. I don't wanna discontinue the momentum. I think we have a good thing going. And so I'm asking for you to join this event by investing $25 and also to support our other free events. See, everything else is free, 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 right? <laughs> so we're trying to keep it free, but we need funding. So to crank the, the gears, you know, the community takes funding and right now we don't have the resources to keep it going. And I also wanna point out to you that we have the president of the University of the Bahamas that's going to be at our meetup on October 28th. This is a big, huge score for us. The fact that he is remitting office sometime soon, but he has generously donated his time to come and speak to us about education for the 21st century. So, you know, all of our events, we appreciate our speakers because they're not paid. We don't have any money to pay them. And so they, they are generously donating their time. So the least we could do is show up and show up in good numbers to support our meetups, to keep our community going. And I think that was all I wanted to say about the website, but please, if you have some time, check out the website, go over the services that we provide we will be offering the certified Scrum Master certification again very soon, possibly in October. I'm working out that date. So those of you who are interested, please send an email to info at creativemindsprojects.com and let us know that you want to be a, one of the persons for the next certified Scrum Master's training that we're going to offer. Um, details will be coming on that. But this is where we at right now. I just wanted to let you know that there's more to this website than just events. So explore the website, look at the services that Creative Minds offers, support Creative Minds so that Creative Minds can have the money to support the community. Let me say that again. Support Creative Minds so that Creative Minds can have the money to continue to support the Bahamas Project Management Community which is a special project underneath Creative Minds. We also have a page that talks specifically about the Bahamas Project Management Community and we have a support button. Support here. Once you click this button, it's gonna take you to a PayPal payment system, which is very secure. Or if you don't wanna use the credit card, we also have a, a, an account at First Caribbean Bank, a local account. So if you wanna send a donation directly to our bank account, we'll appreciate that as well. All of the funding, which is earmarked for the community will be used to cover the cost of running this community. And I think I've said enough. Um, I will now stop sharing my screen so Dr. Larry Davis can take it over. But I would like to say thank you, Colin Thompson, for sharing your slide deck. I was able to send it out to a few persons who requested it. And so they should be up to speed. So yes, my, take it away. my pleasure. <laughs> thank you. Well, very good. I think that that leaves it uh, over to me. So a couple of things uh, for me to comment on is that, uh, first of all, uh, I hope that at some point in time, you will accept cryptocurrency for being able to pay for some of these things. Uh, but just uh, as far as just, you know, for me personally, um, if you'll put me down for a hundred US dollars, uh, I'd be glad to support. So I'm, I'm the first one. So the rest Thank of y'all so need, to, need, to, need to step up and follow suit. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. We appreciate that greatly. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. Uh, I'm glad that I had the chance to be here. I'm going to share my screen now. And uh, what you're seeing on screen is you're seeing a map. 
big fat map of uh, down there in the in the Caribbean Ocean. So um, Florida is somewhere up over here to the left hand upper left hand corner of the screen. For those who aren't familiar with it, uh, this is where uh, a good part of my family is from. So I think I mentioned it the first time that we were on um, that uh, that I have three three of my four grandparents are from the Bahamas. So my dad's mom is from Freeport. Uh, and uh, my mom, so my so, so both of her parents, my mom, are from James Cistern on Luthra. Uh, of course, we're here, you know, in the Bahamas. Uh, so if you didn't know where JC is, that's where it is. Uh, it is not a city. It is not a town. It is a village. Uh, the Two major families uh, that are on the island are the Bethel family and the Johnson family. And if you are one of those folks, you are related to me in some way. Everybody in that village is like a cousin. And the family tree is not a tree. It's more like a bush that kind of looks like this. Uh, my grandmother was a Bethel. She married my grandfather, who was a Johnson. I have cousins who are Johnsons who are married Bethels. So it gets kind of confusing uh, a little bit. Uh, also, my family from Freeport, uh, those are demerits. So anybody who's got any of those family names in there, let me know. You know, we've married some roles and that kind of thing. So, uh, so I, you know, I don't have the accent. My mom, you know, when she came and immigrated, she, she left the accent back home. Uh, but I'm used to hearing it. <laughs> So thank you again for the opportunity to, uh, to, to be here and thank you for, for traveling with me a little bit virtually on my geography. Okay, so uh, we're here this evening uh, to discuss uh, blockchain, right? So this is going to be a, a high level introduction uh, of what I'm going to, um, a high level introduction of the topic on blockchain, right? Uh, so before I begin, I want to offer the following disclaimer, okay? So first of all, I have potential conflicts of interest. I am a co-founder of Exchange Incorporated. Uh, Exchange controls the cryptocurrency, same name. Our ticker symbol is XCZ. Uh, so I own XCZ as well as some other coins. I'm not a financial advisor. I'm not offering any financial advice. I'm not soliciting any investment or purchase of any XCZ or any other kind of cryptocurrency, okay? If, just like with anything else in life, do your own research before you make any kind of investments, make any kind of decisions, choose to get involved with any kind of technology that's here. All right, we've gotten the legal stuff out of the way here. Um, Andrea, thank you for introducing me earlier. Uh, something I want to mention is that all the founders of Exchange are all graduates of HBCUs. So, uh, so Colin Thompson with his MBA, he's from Howard University, and Dr. Damon Bryant, our other co-founder, is also a graduate uh, of Howard University. So. We're going to be giving a high level understanding about blockchain so that you can be able to dive deeper and ask intelligent questions if you're considering getting involved. Uh, first part of the talk is strictly about blockchain. The second part is all about cryptocurrency. So I'm going to pause briefly after the first part for some questions. Uh, and then I plan to leave uh, about uh, 20 to 30 minutes at the end for question and discussions. Um, so write down your questions. If we don't have enough time to get to them in that pause in the middle, we'll talk about them when we're at the end. Discuss things as well. I'm also glad to hang out after the end of this over our allotted time uh, so we can make sure that we get all questions answered. All right, let's get into it. So depending on who you talk to, blockchain is either one of the world's most important developments or it's a fad. Um, any new technology that you have has a hype cycle, right? And any technology that you have just by itself isn't gonna be able to solve any kind of major problem. Uh, so I tend to lean more toward the side of thinking that blockchain is very important. And that's why I chose this quote from the CEO of IBM. It's demonstrating the potential power and application of blockchain technology. So the roots of blockchain are in the roots of money or the history of money. Because once money was invented, um, rulers and then governments quickly became the guarantors and, and the controllers of the money or the currency that was created. So the invention of money very quickly then led to the invention of accounting because you had to keep track of who owns what or who had what available to be able to spend, okay? So the primary tool of doing accounting is not the abacus, it's not the calculator, it's the ledger, 
okay? And we use ledgers to keep track of who owns what or who has what kind of obligations to some others. So initially we use sin single entry accounting where you just had one line saying that this person did something or this company did something, but it's prone to mistakes, you know, because we're human, we make mistakes. Also, if you wanted to cheat people, it's easier to change one line and mess things up. Uh, so some advances had to be made to counter that. And so double entry accounting was implemented in the 1400s and it's been used ever since. It has a built-in error detection because you have to match outputs with inputs. Everything's got to line up. And the only way that you're going to cheat that is if you have an additional extra set of books under the couch or something, okay? So that's talking about ledgers. But now we, we think about uh, the technology of today and we talk about these different terms, right? We talk about um, blockchain, we talk about distributed ledger. And you may have heard the terms being used interchangeably. So you might be asking yourself, well, what's the difference? Well, the principles are still the same in the in as far as dealing with ledgers. Um, but the thing is, is that a ledger can, can be distributed, okay? So when we say a distributed ledger, it's essentially a database that gets spread across multiple computing devices. So distributed means that there's no central authority. It means that you the, the database doesn't have to go back to one place and check for, for, for things, or that it has one place where it has to get the source of truth from. It means that distributed means that the updates are handled independently by each device. And the network collectively, so all the devices that are connected, they vote upon each of the updates. And if the majority of them agree, then the distributed database or the ledger updates itself. And the last version of what's agreed upon is what's saved and gets passed out to everybody else. So that's how things are synchronized. That's how things are controlled within a decentralized or a distributed framework. Okay. So now um, I know that folks have their hands off, but let's go just virtually wherever you are right now. I want a show of hands. Okay. I want to know how many folks out here enjoy a nice glass of scotch. Okay. So get your hand up, get your hand up, you know, virtually. Okay, yes, yes, I like to have a nice scotch. Uh, and and when we when we when we have scotch, right? When you or when you first have scotch, one of the first things you learn is that every scotch is a whiskey, but not every whiskey is a scotch. Similarly, every blockchain is a distributed ledger, but not every distributed ledger is a blockchain. Okay. So when we get to our question session at the end, we get done, you know, well, I get done talking and, and get done answering some questions or whatever. I'm going to pour a beverage and you can join me virtually if you choose to. No offense to anybody if you're choosing to abstain, you know, or not, but we'll be going there. Okay, so what is a blockchain? We've talked a lot about blockchain, 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 blockchain. Well, a blockchain is just a form of a distributed ledger, okay? And updates to that distributed ledger, those updates on a blockchain are transactions, okay? So a transaction is when an asset, so this is either money or property or stock, some form of digital information gets exchanged between two entities. And those entities could be people, it could be computers, it could be web pages. As long as it's just two parties that are in a transaction or that are, that are exchanging something, a transaction is occurring. So the structure of the blockchain only allows transactions to be added. So each new transaction that's added gets linked to the previous one, okay? And you keep on going, you add more transactions and more transactions, and eventually you have a chain of transactions. Now, for the computer scientists who are in the audience, uh, two raised to the power of 10 is 1,024. It's a very special number. And when you have 1,024 transactions chained together, that makes up a block. So you have those. 1,024 transactions grouped into a block, the next transaction that happens starts a new block. So additional transactions that come into that blockchain are added to the new block. And eventually you get another 1,024 transactions 
They get chained together and they form an additional block. So once you put enough blocks together, the old blocks end up getting compressed because you need to save some space. But what you get is you essentially have an infinite chain of blocks of transactions. That's why we call it a blockchain. Yeah, English is, is, is like that. Sometimes it's really evident. So we have a blockchain now, okay? So what about hackers? Everybody's talking about, well, is the block safe? I heard about things happening, right? So you got this hacker, right? And it's just data. So I should be able to just go in and change the data. That way, change the transaction, just give myself some cash. I could say, hey, I'm gonna take this transaction where Andrea was sending Larry some cash. I'm going to divert that cash to my account. So now I've got free money, right? Well, wrong. You can't do that because the blockchain structure is what prevents it. So I'm a hacker. I'm just going to go in here and change that transaction. No, you're not. Because the previous hash is what prevents it. A hash is just a cryptographic way of signing a block. And we sign transactions. We also sign the entire block that gets created. So as a hacker, if you want to change one transaction here, you have to either know all of the transactions that occur and all of the hashes, everything, or you can just go ahead and try to find the appropriate hash by just maybe, you know, cracking it, like trying some new, some different combinations, right? Well, if you just want to try different combinations, it's going to take 30 trillion, that's 30 with a T, trillion years if you want to crack one block. Or you could just try to get lucky instead of trying to crack it, you know, with a brute force password cracking scheme, you could just try to guess. Well, guessing it is even worse because your odds are one in 1 billion billion. That means one chance out of a one followed by 18 zeros. So in modern technology terms or current technology terms, blockchain is not able to be hacked. It's unhackable. Now, when we have quantum computers, maybe in 20 years, that might change something. But for now, it's unhackable. So if you hear about somebody hacking the blockchain, they didn't hack the blockchain. It means that they exploited somebody's account or somebody's wallet or some form of social engineering is what occurred. Okay, so we've talked about the history. We've talked about what ledgers are. We've talked about what blockchains are, okay? What we want to understand is uh, exactly uh, what do we want to do with this, right? And a key point that I want to point out here or a key point I want to make is that Blockchain is not cryptocurrency, okay? It's a technology. It makes cryptocurrency possible, but blockchain by itself is not cryptocurrency. Every coin that you hear about, you know, people talk about Bitcoin all the time, or you talk about Ethereum, or like X chains, my coin. Every coin has its own blockchain. And the beauty of blockchains are that applications can be run on such blockchains. That's why we love it. That's why we think this technology has a lot of possibility. So we've got this ability of being able to keep track of things, right? Um, and there are a lot of areas where blockchain is being applied that's going to help to, that where, where folks may need some help keeping track of things, okay? So any place or any area where ownership or provenance you know, provenance is when we say, okay, where did something come from? Who was the creator, uh, you know? What, what's the lineage of something, right? So anything with ownership, provenance, or identity verification, any of those places where you need that is eligible for disruption by blockchain, okay? You got diverse areas like digital identity, like real estate and logistics, among many, many other areas where disruption is already occurring, okay? And in the next few slides, I'm gonna highlight what I think are three of the hottest areas where we have blockchain disruption occurring right now, okay? All right, so the first one I wanna talk about are smart contracts, okay? Many of the applications that use the blockchain, they use a mechanism called smart contracts to manifest their services. Okay, some applications are only possible because of smart contracts. So in a traditional contract, you've got two parties and they make some rules for agreement. They end up writing it up inside of a contract. Um, then 
Those agreements are enforced or, or assisted by a third party and eventually everything gets executed, okay? Think about when you buy a house, right? You wanna buy a house, you got a seller, you got a buyer and the escrow agent is the third party. And the escrow agent is typically the, the party that gets the titles for the land, that makes sure that you have enough money in the bank to buy it, make sure that the, the loan that exists on the house gets paid off before transferring money from different parties, okay? They're involved in it and they have to be paid as well. Well, the beautiful thing about smart contracts is that it eliminates third parties explicitly, okay? Now, a smart contract is literally the translation of contract language into computer code. So you got a programming language where you're writing out instructions. You do that, but you do that with what's inside of a traditional contract, okay? So that code language forms a set of rules that are automatically executed and validated. Okay, and the contract code is what gets uploaded to the blockchain. So the distributed network participants execute the code only when the conditions within the contract are met. So you've got some specific advantages with that. First advantage is that it's always enforceable and will always be enforced. If that contract specifies that you are supposed to receive a certain amount of money from a certain party at a certain date, the contract is going to execute. You don't have a choice about whether it's executing or not. If the conditions don't exist for the contract to execute, the contract itself will not have been validated and put on the block. So that's beautiful. It's always enforceable. It's cryptographically provable, which means that you can determine through signatures that Everything that's involved here has been involved properly. You can tell if something gets modified or somebody's trying to change the terms of it. You have a signature that verifies that what's in the contract is what was intended. And you can preserve your anonymity if you want to. You can, you can make an identity for yourself that completely obscures who you are and just use that to interact with, okay? Um, so you don't have to put your name on it if you don't want to, or you can, just depends on you. So those are advantages of smart contracts. But smart contracts also come with challenges. One of the biggest challenges is that they can't be changed. Once information gets written to the block, it's there. It's, it's, it's there, it's cryptographically there, and the network cannot update it. So if you write a bad contract, it's not going to be changed. You have to go through all kinds of machinations to do something different, okay? Also, the cost and the speed of the contract execution depends on the blockchain that you use. Ethereum, by far and away, like 98% of smart contracts currently are done using Ethereum. One of the problems of using the Ethereum blockchain is that it's slow and it costs a lot of money. No, they're trying to fix that right now, but you're still limited to the capabilities of the chain when you are doing the transactions in the smart contract, okay? Now, you might think, oh, this is just, you know, this is just theoretical. This is, this is not really happening, but no, it actually is, okay? You've heard people talk about DeFi or decentralized finance. Well, decentralized finance lending is all over the place right now. And there's a, there's a company called Aave, which is the number one protocol slash site for doing this thing. So you could take your crypto, you could put it on this protocol or on this network and lend it to people already. Um, if you've ever gotten travel insurance, there's a company called AXA. I've used AXA before. AXA is issuing flight delay insurance using smart contracts already. Walmart's using smart contracts for their supply chain. There's a company called Ascribe that's using smart contracts to provide proof of ownership for intellectual property as well. So this isn't just theoretical, uh, you know, theoretical developments that we're talking about. It's actually in use. So the next area I wanna talk about are NFTs, non-fungible tokens. Uh, NFTs are just digital items that are sold on the blockchain. You use some smart contracts, you sell uh, some digital items there. So selling things like art, like music, like animated GIFs. So NFTs have actually been around technologically since 2014, but they've recently, like they are blowing up. They are all the rage. When people talk about crypto, they're talking about DeFi, they're talking about NFTs, okay? The beauty of NFTs is that artists don't have to have a gallery 
or an auction house in order to sell their art or a record label even, right? Now you can sell your art directly to the consumer as an NFT. So the artist gets to keep more profit. Uh, they can build a smart contract such that they program in royalties. It means anytime that their art gets sold, they get a percentage of it, right? Or even if it gets sold to a new owner. Like if I, if, if I bought a, a, a painting by Kehinde Wiley uh, and then I sold it to my brother, well, Kehinde Wiley didn't get any money off that, that transaction that I had with my brother. And he's the original artist. He should get paid for that. Well, you can change that now with NFTs, okay? So um, I want to point out uh, that there's a lot of really, really interesting things that are happening in the NFT space. One of the most interesting for me that I, I just love um, is one that was based on uh, something called Nyancat. Now, if you're, if you're young enough, maybe, maybe young enough or old enough, I don't know what you would say, but in April of 2011, we got Nyancat. <laughs> so Chris Torres is the creator of the Nyancat GIF, right? And he recently uh, had an NFT sale for this. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and play this for you. If you have your volume up right now, you might want to turn it down a little bit just to make sure you don't blow out your eardrums or wake up the neighbors or something like that. But this is Nyancat if you don't already know what it is. So you can imagine, yes, you have three and a half minutes of that, but it was a major, major thing. Like, you know, I, I, my, my kids are old enough that when they were in late elementary school, that Nyan Cat was all the rage. Everybody was, was playing it. So anyway, so Chris Torres, in February, he sold the animated gift for this for 300 Ethereum. Mm -hmm. uh, it was approximately $600,000 at the time when he sold it. And apologize for that, um, for that interruption there. Um, so what we want to do on our exchange is that we want to be offering NFTs. Um, and, you know, the founders, you know, Dr. Bryant uh, and, 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 and Colin, we've been talking about it. And we think that we're going to put this protocol uh, as part of our exchange blockchain um, within the first quarter of 2022. So that's going to be exciting for us. The third thing I want to talk about is I want to talk about digital credentials, okay? Um, and if you've been on LinkedIn or like what we're even talking about, you know, at the start of this meeting where you're certified Scrum Master, right? You see a post from somebody in your network, they've earned a new certification, and now they got a badge or a PDF that links to a longer, more official certification. So in the process, you've got the credential that's earned from issued from the institution, the learner has it, they've got a badge. Now the learner can display that badge to their audience on their socials or, or whatever. Um, and then at some point, a potential employer or, or, or maybe some other institution wants to verify what's going on with that credential, okay? So they verify the credential, it goes back to the, to the, to the uh, issuing institution. They say, yes, this person earned this credential. Well, what we're doing at Exchange right now is we're decentralizing this process so that the institution doesn't have to provide the service and we're making it possible for the learner to choose what information they wanna disclose. Um, so this is selective disclosure. So an example of this is that if you have your transcript, your academic transcript um, and the requirements for your job are that you have to have a 2.5 GPA. Well, you got a 2.5 GPA, but maybe you've got some courses in there where you didn't do so hot. You don't want your employer to know that. Well, then selective disclosure would allow you to say, hey, you can look at my transcript and verify that I have a 2.5 GPA, but I don't need you seeing that I failed basket weaving, okay? So this feature we hope to be rolling out on our X chains um, in the last quarter of this year. We're already doing the research. We've already got initial development behind it, and we're excited about being able to, uh, to do that. Okay, so we've talked about the blockchain. We've talked about what it is. We've talked about how it's being used, the different application areas uh, that are there for us. And once we know these things, what we wanna go ahead and go to is we wanna look at, I, you know, I, I don't wanna say it's the king application, but definitely it's the one that's the most popular, right? And that's cryptocurrency. 
Okay, so on October 31st, 2008, Satoshi Nakamoto published a paper that described a digital currency. Okay, now Satoshi Nakamoto, we have no idea who this person is. Uh, could be a researcher someplace, could be, you know, it's just a computer hacker in a basement somewhere. Uh, it could be a group of people. We have no idea who or what Satoshi Nakamoto is. All we know is that Satoshi dropped this idea on it, basically showed us how to make Bitcoin. And so it was created. That, and the title of the paper was Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. Okay. The beautiful thing was that at this point in history, networks existed and we were pretty good at doing networks. Like we mastered Ethernet, we had Wi-Fi now. Networks, we were good with networks. Digital encryption was great. Okay, we can do all these different certificates and things like that. We're good. We've got personal privacy. We have signatures built into applications. What was missing was a way to create a coin and keep track of the transactions in a trustless environment. And that is what blockchain enabled. So now you fast forward to today, crypto is one of the hottest technology or investment areas, right? Uh, and the term cryptocurrency, when we look at it, is just cryptography plus currency. Digital information gets assigned a value. It's protected by a network of encrypted records and it doesn't have a centralized control place, okay? So every cryptocurrency that we talked about, that we talk about is represented by a coin and each coin has its own blockchain, okay? Now, something that's gonna make the crypto bros mad, um, but it's the truth, is that crypto is nowhere close to replacing fiat currency, okay? Fiat currency is the currency that gets issued by the government. Um, even though the enthusiasts would like you to believe that it is, it isn't, okay? So crypto is still an equity, okay? And like other equities or other, you know, things that you invest in, crypto has markets and you buy and sell and exchange cryptocurrencies on those markets. Okay, so when we're on the markets, we're buying and selling, here's what I consider the blue chip cryptocurrencies right now. OK, and this list could change, you know, within two weeks from now because cryptocurrency markets can be volatile. But I think that these are pretty safe bets for what I think are going to be the blue chip cryptocurrencies. Right. First of all, is the granddaddy of them all, Bitcoin. It's the most popular cryptocurrency. It's currently the gold standard for the entire community. Everything is priced relative to Bitcoin or BTC, and it's a universally accepted form of payment anywhere that you can use crypto to pay for things. OK. So if Bitcoin is the gold standard, then Ethereum is the silver standard, okay? So Ethereum is the largest blockchain by far that's used for smart contracts, okay? The next crypto I want to talk about is Ripple. So Ripple is very heavily used in banking. Um, and it's got an extremely large circulating volume. And a lot of your financiers or your folks who are coming in from places like JP Morgan or Goldman Sachs, they are using Bitcoin, but they're also using Ripple, okay? Next is Litecoin. So Litecoin uh, is used for liquidity. Uh, very fast peer-to-peer -peer transactions, a very fast network. Uh, it's almost as universally accepted as Bitcoin. Uh, when Coinbase started, uh, uh, and we'll talk about Coinbase a little bit later, but when Coinbase started uh, offering cryptos that you could trade cash in, trade into, Litecoin was, uh, was, was one of them. So that was a, a very good thing for, for them. Next is Tether. Tether is what we call a stable coin, okay? So a stable coin addresses one of the major weaknesses of cryptocurrency, which is volatility, okay? The price of cryptos can change 20% in a single day. Not good if you're trying to actually buy things with it. So it's called Tether because it's tied directly to the US, to the value of the US dollar. So it makes it very stable, makes it attractive for investment as well. Finally, I want to mention Cardano. Cardano is the hottest coin on the market right now because they are very, very deliberate in how they do development. Uh, they're also backed by very smart, like the academics are, you know, are involved with creating Cardanos. And yes, I'm biased because I'm a PhD. But more than that, investors are very high on this coin right now because they are about to unveil a viable alternative to Ethereum for smart contracts. Okay, 
So these are your blue chippers right now. If you're going to start learning about coins, at some point, you're probably going to want to, want to learn about either one or multiple ones of, of these. Uh, and because I have a coin, it's X-Chain, I'm going to throw X-Chain on here too. But again, that's just, this, we're, we're not a blue chip, but you know, it's a hopeful addition. <laughs> All right. So you got coins. Now you got to know about trading, right? Well, trading is just like any other security or commodity that you have. If you've heard about Forex, if you know about stocks, if you know about you know, utilities or bond markets or whatever, it's traded the exact the same way, right? Your different coins are traded on exchanges and each exchange has trading pairs that it lists, okay? So the same rules apply, you know, buy low, sell high, you follow your trends, you know, be, be wary of anybody giving you a hot tip, right? Well, the number one exchange in the world right now is Binance. Uh, so you'll probably find a lot of uh, a lot of coins that you didn't even know about on Binance, but all of your blue chips are certainly going to be there. In addition to being able to trade on an exchange, you got to have a place where you can start to do research, right? Well, Coin Market Cap is the place for finding out about major coin projects that are going on right now, okay? This is the starting point for any of your market research. Any coin that's worth its salt is gonna be listed on here. They're gonna have a link to it's their research page. Uh, you'll find all the information about the trading volumes, what exchanges they're traded on. You're gonna find coins here that you can trade and exchanges that you can go to, okay? And what you wanna look at here is you wanna look at you know, not just the price, but you also want to look at the market cap, which is the number of coins that are in circulation multiplied by its current price. Um, if you'll notice, look at my picture that I've got here. Uh, I've got this picture that shows Bitcoin at $13,000. Well, I, I left it in here because I thought it was kind of cool. It's kind of historic, you know, but uh, Bitcoin is trading well, 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 well above uh, $13,000. But hey, don't, be, don't believe the hype. Don't get, don't get caught in, in hype. I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit too, um, a little bit later. Okay, so we've got, uh, we've got cryptos, we've got coins, we've got trading places, we've got exchanges, we've got a Dow Jones Industrial Average to check ourselves against. Um, you have to have some sort of way of converting your fiat to crypto and your crypto back to fiat. Well, outside of the United States, you have a lot of options. Inside the United States though, you only got two options right now. You've got Coinbase and you have Binance. And they serve as what we call on-ramps and off-ramps. An on-ramp allows you to convert from fiat to crypto. Off-ramps, reverse it, go from crypto to your fiat, okay? Um, not only are these the ones that are available for you as customers, but I, I, I think that they are the, they're the biggest also, but you know, I, I could be wrong. So usually what you do is you go to Coinbase or Binance, you use your, your dollars, you buy Bitcoin, and then you convert your Bitcoin to other things and go from there. Okay, so probably also wondering now, well, you know, what's Denzel Washington and the Magnificent Seven got to do with any of this? Well, I put this up here because it's literally the wild, wild west when it comes to dealing with cryptocurrencies and crypto projects, okay? There's very little regulation worldwide. Um, some countries have embraced crypto, um, but not that many. There are tons of scams around, like tons and tons of scams, okay? And you have to know how the government in your area is going to respond to cryptocurrencies, how they're going to treat it, how they're going to treat uh, money or earnings. You also have to know about KYC, which is know your customer. So this is something that's done to try to prevent money laundering and trying to make sure that hey, are you actually a person? Are you somebody that the, the, the government would deem as legitimate for doing this? Are you taking you know, $100,000 of drug money and trying to put it inside of here so that you can you know, make, you know, basically legitimize yourself, right? So governments are watching out for this, but also you need to watch out for this in dealing with cryptocurrency, right? So we've talked about blockchain, talked about cryptocurrency, you know, what it is and kind of some of the mechanisms that are around it. So you got your burning question, right? And this is for, for, for I think, for, for a lot of people, right? When anybody's coming up to me, they're always asking me, how do I get started in crypto? 
<laughs> okay. So what I'm going to give you is I'm going to give you what, in my opinion, what I think the steps are for how you get started with this. Okay. The process is the same for any kind of new investment or any kind of new practice that you're starting. Right. And the very first thing is you got to understand the fundamentals. Notice that I have this in bold. Notice that I have this underlined, right? If you do not understand the fundamentals, you're going to lose money. You're going to, I mean, you can learn the hard way if you want to, but I strongly, 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 strongly recommend that you understand the fundamentals. You know, do you know what a wallet is? Do you know what market cap means? You know, what are the things that you need to understand in order to make trades successful, okay? Understand the fundamentals, number one. Number two, what you wanna do after you've understood the fundamentals, um, find some coins that you like, right? And then read those white papers. Why read the white papers? Because that tells you what the philosophy of the organization is, tells you the directions that they're going. Now, a lot of coins have been known to lie in their white papers, okay? Or, you know, just, you know, not just lie, but, you know, there's just inaccuracies that are in there, right? And it's like the prospectus with any kind of investment that you make. The prospectus is always that, you know, nothing is guaranteed, right? But still, you want to learn to read the white paper so you can learn to kind of have a BS meter so you can detect, okay, I've heard this before. Uh, yeah, this doesn't sound right. Okay. But so find the coins you like based on what they do, what industry they're in read the white papers. Next thing that you want to do, make some simulated trades, okay? And how many you do, maybe you only do a couple and then you're comfortable. Maybe you need to do 10 or 20 and then you'll feel comfortable. But give yourself some virtual cash or some virtual crypto, make a trade with it, see how things turn out. You know, follow the steps for where you would go and what you would do, but just do some simulated trades and gain, gain some comfort with that, okay? Once you're comfortable with those first three things, the next thing that you have to do is you've got to have an on-ramp. So you need to open an account on Coinbase, and they're going to ask you to do KYC. This takes time. So if you've got something hot that's coming up, you don't want to wait until the day before to go make your account on Coinbase and then get in. That's not going to happen. You have to allow for, at least in my case, I had to allow for like a week. It might be a couple of weeks, depending on how many people they have in the pipeline. But you need to have time to open this account on Coinbase, okay? Or in your country, whatever the equivalent uh, change is going to be that's there. Next thing, once you have opened that account, your first thing should be to buy a very small amount of one of those blue chip coins, okay? And the reason why I suggest doing that is because you need to understand intimately, like how long does it take to process these things? Um, before you go putting in large orders, you need to understand small orders. You need to understand the process of how this whole thing works, okay? Uh, so small amount on blue chips, right? Next thing after that would be make sure that you buy an offline hardware wallet to store your coins when you are not trading. You never, ever, ever store your coins on an exchange, ever. Because when you hear about these hacks, right, like Mt. Gox or, or what, what was the one that happened you know, most recently, somebody's wallet got broken into or somebody's account on an exchange got broken into and the hackers cleaned out all their money or all the coins that were inside of the account. Never store your coins on an exchange. So buy an offline hardware wallet. It's called cold storage to store your coins when you are not trading them, okay? Now, if you're going to be trading them, you know, you know, then you might want to have a software wallet, but someplace that's not the exchange to store these, okay? Next thing you need to do is you need to open an account on an exchange because you have to be able to trade one coin for another once you've on-ramped, okay? You're going to want to find something different. You want to, you, you know, unless you just want to use Bitcoin, and that's great. You just buy the Bitcoin and hold it and sell it as much as you want to. But if you want to get into something else, you're going to have to exchange. Uh, and then after you've done that, now make some small trades. Again, small trades. You might earn some money, and you know, but but don't hold your breath. Okay, you're going to lose money at some point in time while you are doing this. Um, you're not going to become a millionaire overnight. All right. But more importantly than all of those things, right? I'm telling you, get, don't you know how to get started in crypto? Do not get ripped off. Okay. I want to say that 
I'm somebody who's knowledgeable. I'm somebody I know about the technology. I, you know, I've, I've been following crypto since like 2014. I've got certifications in the field and I got scammed. <laughs> so understand that, that you, you could still get ripped off here. So you have to do your homework. There's no regulation. There's no court that you can go to to say, oh, this coin ripped me off. I want my money back. There, there's, there's nothing on your side, okay? So you have to do your homework. It's in bold, it's underlined, it's got three exclamation points behind it. Please, please, please. Don't get ripped off, do your homework, okay? Again, never store coins or cash on an exchange, okay? Also, never use the same address twice for transactions. Remember how I talked about an anonymity, right? How you could, you could create an ID so that you could use it to, to do trades or to, or to, to, to to be able to, to have interactions with folks, right? Well, every time that you want to make a transaction, you need to use a new ID because your tracks can be traced. And eventually people could find out that, oh yeah, it's Larry who's doing that. Or at least it's this one address. And I know that this one address has at least a thousand Bitcoin sitting in it, which makes you a target. You don't want to be a target. Don't use the same address twice. Okay. Use two-factor authentication everywhere. You should be doing this on any of the sites where you have logins right now. Because if somebody gets your login information, and if you don't have it protected with two-factor authentication, they could just be you and do whatever they want to with you. Particularly when you're dealing with money, set up the two-factor authentication. Especially you should be doing it on your mobile phone accounts as well. Okay. Make sure you go down to at and you set up your two-factor that's there. All right. Another thing is you want to be as anonymous as possible. Please, folks, you know, use an alias. Never post on crypto, about your crypto on social, okay? You're just making yourself a target. And believe me, the, the criminals and the hackers and the scammers are paying attention to all of that, okay? Don't talk about your crypto publicly. Like, it's like Fight Club, right? You know, first rule of Fight Club, you don't talk about Fight Club. First rule of crypto, don't talk about the crypto that you have, okay? All right. So we know all these things, and I want you to take this most seriously, okay? Don't get caught up, okay? I put some acronyms on here. FOMO, fear of missing out. Don't get caught up in the fear of missing out. That's going to drive some decision. Oh, if I don't do this now, oh, I'm going to miss out. Make your decisions based on rational information. Follow whatever plan you came up with at first. Don't get caught up in fear of missing out. Also, you've got your crypto bros who are out here who will tell you HODL. HODL is, uh, is a misspelling of the word hold. Um, and you know, you got people who, are, who will be telling you hold, 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 hold. Meanwhile, they're in the back selling, 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 selling. And because you're holding, you're helping to keep the price up. OK, that's a, a classic feature of pump and dump schemes. If you are going to hodl or hold, make sure it's because of your own reasons, your reasoning, your, you know, the guidance that you've established for yourself. OK, you hear people in chats all the time on crypto talking about Lambos or moons, right? Because that's everybody's thing, right? Oh, man, I'm going to score big on this crypto and I'm going to go get me a Lambo, Lambo, right? And if you talk about FOMO, oh, this one's going to the moon. And so, you know, they won't say, hey, it's going to the moon. They'll just put moon in the chat or Lambda in the chat. You see that stuff? Don't get caught up in any of that kind of stuff. Please, please, please do your own homework. Don't get caught up in the hype. And be because I'm talking about getting up, getting caught up in the hype, I, I, I got to bring this dude out here. Now, maybe you've seen this meme, maybe you haven't, but but I need for you to just take a look at this real quick if you if you haven't known it, okay? Hey, hey, hey. And turn your volume down again. Make sure you don't hey, have your hey, volume hey. down. This dude is loud. Hey, hey, hey. What's up, 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 no, no, no. Be connect. Wow. Be connect. Be connect. 
and now your eardrums are shattered all the glass in your apartment or your 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 house or whatever is broken uh but my goodness like like dude calm down but you know just please just google that google bitconnect google scam uh and you'll learn about that hey okay so my parting thoughts um you've got opportunities and you've got caution now this last um, slide that's here, I'm going to read this. You know, it's a little bit lengthy, but you know, but 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 stay with me on this here, okay? When I say we must be involved, that means we as people of the diaspora, people who are responsible citizens, we have to be involved with tech and how tech gets uh, instantiated or gets pushed out to everybody, right? So right now we have a small elite group of white men who tend to overestimate their mathematical abilities, who have systematically excluded women and people of color in favor of machines for centuries, who tend to want to make science fiction real, who have little regard for social convention, who don't believe that social norms or rules apply to them, AKA Elon Musk, who have unused piles of money, government money sitting around, and who have adopted the ideological rhetoric of far-right libertarian anarcho-capitalists. What could possibly go wrong? So educate yourselves. Read summaries on new technology so you have familiarity with the potential impacts and challenges. No matter what field you're in, you're affected by technology, so you have to be aware. Tech for the take of, sake of tech is not going to solve society's problems. At the same time, we do have opportunities in front of us. So let's level up and take advantage of them, okay? All right. So if you want to connect with us, these are the places that you can connect. Twitter, Telegram, ticker symbols, all those good things. Or you can also, if you want to, you know, if you want to, you know, connect with me on LinkedIn, that's great. Just please, I just ask that you, if you're going to message me, just tell me you're from this event uh, so that I can connect and not just, you know, just think that you're, you know, some random dude or some random woman just, just uh, trying to connect with me. All right, very good. So thank you for the time, Andrea. Thank you for the platform. Um, now let's, let's, let's discuss, let's answer any questions that you have. I uh, hope you took notes. hope you wrote down your questions. Let's get after it. Thank you so much, Dr. Davis. I have a question that I know no one else is going to ask, but I'm going to ask it because I'm always the, the bold student in the classroom. I want to know, how can I make money from blockchain and cryptocurrency? Everything you discuss is great. You and Colin did an awesome job this month educating us. But now I want to know, how can I make some money? Well, that's like the secret for everybody, right? Uh, so again, I'm not a financial advisor, so you know you got to do your own homework on on anything that 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 that's happening here. Um, I can tell you what's worked for me, uh, and one of you know. And so the first thing that you that you have to understand is what's your risk tolerance, right? Um, so there are different levels of risk that are associated with different projects. Um, once you know, so you know, so are you super risky? Are you really conservative? Or are you somewhere in the middle? Um, once you've determined your, your risk profile, then you need to find the projects that match it. Um, so for somebody who's less risky, just buying and holding Bitcoin might be fine. Or buying some Ethereum and putting it into a decentralized uh, finance um, loan pool might be fine. Um, making investments, uh, investing in uh, people who are doing Bitcoin mining. Uh, mining is the process of, of racing to create new blocks in the chain. And that's what actually gets you coins. And processing the transactions also helps make you money um, in, this, in the space as well. Um, one of the things that I like to do is I like to, I like to buy um, proof of stake coins, which is a way that the system figures out how to determine if a transaction should be allowed into the blockchain or not, um, buy, proof of, buy proof of stake coins um, and run what's called a, a master node, be one of the participants in the network. So you're passively making income in the form of that coin all the time. Um, 
I haven't had as much success as far as, okay, I'm buying a Cardano today and I'm going to watch the news and I'm going to sell the Cardano uh, next week when the earnings report comes out. Uh, you know, I think, you know, when it comes to day trading, and that's what that is, uh, only 20% of day traders actually make money. 80% of day traders lose money. And it's because they, you know, most people who day trade aren't disciplined, but they will only tell you about the times when they hit big. Uh, so, you know, so, you know, so, so I'm a, I am a master note holder. I've done, you know, I, I've done that. I've had, I've had good success with that. Um, I haven't had such good success with, you know, picking, you know, picking out, you know, coins or, and, and doing that kind of thing. Um, some of the, you know, some of the long-term holdings have, have worked out well. Um, and also, let me offer, also offer one more uh, piece of advice or, or just maybe my personal opinion here, okay? Um, it's that Bitcoin itself, right? And Colin's probably heard me say this before, right? Bitcoin itself isn't based on anything but, but public reputation. And the bottom could drop out of it tomorrow. Now, is it going to happen? You know, I don't know. But Bitcoin to me is exactly equivalent to the Dutch tulip scandal. Um, just, you know, Google Dutch tulip scandal. Basically, you know, everybody wanted tulips. Everybody wanted tulips. And eventually somebody had a big warehouse full of tulips. And then like one of the, one of the monarchs said, I don't like tulips anymore. So overnight, Nobody wanted tulips. So all these people who had bunches and bunches and bunches of tulips in their in their storehouses basically lost their shirts because they had invested so you know so so heavily in there. Um, so you know so when it comes to things like Bitcoin, I, I would just make sure that I'm not the last one holding the bag. But when it comes to things like Ethereum or like Cardano, like there's actual value behind that because it's, it it has use, it has utility, whereas Bitcoin is is a is a standard bearer. Um, but, you know, again, that's my opinion, and that's how I think about making money, uh, you know, using, you know, in crypto right now. This is, this is very interesting, and my, my the wheels in my brain are turning, and, you know, I have a creative mind, uh, hence the name of my company, Creative Minds, and so I'm always trying to think of ways um, to learn something new. And so this has been food for my brain. I came very tired and rushing to get here on time, but I've still been fed. So I appreciate um, this presentation very much. I think that we need to talk off camera about collaborating on doing some virtual workshops or something, because it's like, I feel like I still have some missing dot, dot, dots. Like it's not completely filled in. And you, I know you say, do your own homework and all that stuff. But I just love to hear you guys present and talk from your own experience. And it's so much better than reading something or trying to watch YouTube videos. So, you know, we, we definitely have to discuss how we're going to do something, some collaboration with this blockchain and keep this conversation going. I'm thinking I'm thinking a, a mini workshop. You know, you guys can tell me what you're feeling or if you'd be interested in something like that for our community. Um, I'm just waiting on the cameras yeah. to come on. They're acting like they didn't see my yeah. little request in the chat. So, yeah. so, so Andrea, I want Larry to, to follow up on your question because you asked a question a lot of people ask, how can I make money on Bitcoin, right? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, cryptocurrencies. But one thing we got to talk about that people don't think about is taxes. So Larry, can you just talk about the fact that yes, in the US and some other countries, you must pay taxes on oh, your transactions my goodness right? would that uh, also apply to us i mean i guess we'd be trading on your on the u.s market so that would apply to us well i think it depends on where you it, reside it depends, where you pay it depends. i mean i, I mean it, it, it depends on it depends right um but uh but i am i am so glad that you that you asked that question colin uh because i have a slide directly uh for that uh let's see here i'm going to Let's switch this around. And you must consider uh, taxation, right? In any financial advisor will tell you that when you are, you know, when you're choosing a strategy or when you're doing something that you have to consider tax ramifications. Now, 
whether or not you should be making decisions based on taxes is is questionable. You know, you have to be at a particular tax bracket to make decisions solely on taxes. But so these are the countries. That, so the ones in green are the ones where you have actual tax laws uh, about them, right? Some places it's like well, maybe, we, we're not really quite sure yet, uh, but in others, um, they're actually taking very strong steps towards things like, you know, like money laundering, right? You, so you notice that you've got a lot of countries in Europe that have um, tax laws about it. Um, you know, the United States is notoriously blank. A lot of places in the world are still just blank. Um, and one of the interesting things that you're going to find is that in countries where the currencies are strong, they have very little incentive for making you know, laws or tax codes friendly for cryptocurrency, right? Because they don't wanna encourage that. You know, if I have, you know, you know, if I'm China, I'm sitting here, I got a strong currency. I don't want you using Bitcoin. I want you using you know, Chinese Yuan. If, you know, and, you know, same thing with the, with the U.S., right? If U.S. dominant currency in the world, I want you using dollars. I don't want you using that other stuff. So um, anything that earns you money, in theory, should be a capital gains tax in the United States. I'm not sure how the Bahamian law is with regard to, to capital gains. So when, so in the U.S., when we, if we're doing things with stock transactions, right, we sell the, the, the brokerage house keeps a record of that sale. <laughs> and then at the end of the year, we get a little thing that says, hey, here's how much you made on your transaction. You need to attach this to your taxes. <laughs> and then the brokerage house is, is filing with the government to tell them that, hey, Larry made this much. Uh, so on one hand, you don't have an entity that's doing that, that's reporting that. But at some point that money is going to, if you make, if you make money, like let's just say, let's say you, you have a good run and you make 10 grand, 10 grand showing up in your account, it's got to be accounting for, right? It just doesn't show up. So, um, you know, in the U.S. you have to, you, you, you're probably better off declaring that stuff in the U.S., but I know that a lot of people don't. Um, and there are going to be some folks who get bit by this, but thank you, Colin, for asking the question about, uh, about taxes. And, um, if you if you set up exchange if you set up an account on an exchange, you may end up being routed through a particular country, and you might have to abide by the tax laws in that country too. So pay attention to the exchange that you sign up on, uh, as far as you know where they are hosted or quote unquote you know the business is located. This sounds very complicated, but. <laughs> But I know, I know for us, you know, I think our major concern would be getting red flagged for, mo for money laundering. You know? Yes, abso absolutely. Like, we, don't, we, so, we don't want that to happen. Yeah. So, so, if, so I would suggest that, you know, so you could take the approach that I take, I file it. I say, yep, I made this money. Same thing with like people who, you know, they're professional gamblers, right? All they do is they just say, yeah, I made this money gambling, you know, on these sessions or whatever. And they they file it in their in their taxes and they don't catch trouble. It's the people who try to hide it, try to be slick, and those are the ones who end up you know catching catching trouble. So just you know just understand that if you make money, you know death and taxes are unavoidable. <laughs> so try to you know try to pay as as little as legally bound, <laughs> but yes. but but still you know you gotta account for for having to for having to pay them. <laughs> Yes, amen. Just, just be honest, and and uh, you know, and and I'm I'm willing to, to to make this into a longer, you know, a day long kind of thing or whatever. If folks want, if if there's interest in the community, uh, you know, and and they're in and and they are involved. <laughs> yes, I will. I will definitely put out some feelers and find out if that's something we should push forward to. I see Jackie giving us a thumbs up. Um, I know Mr. Jacks had have some interest in in blockchain and Bitcoin and all that stuff. That's a thumbs up from him. And so I'll just put it out there and see, you know, if we if we have that many persons interested, where we could actually do a little one day workshop or something. But um, I don't think the cameras are coming on today. Um, so yeah, I'm just gonna go and take this picture. <laughs> 
I think well, this we got, be, got a little bit. <laughs> yeah, this, this, this may be all of the cameras that we're going to get. So I'm going to just take this for what it is and do my usual <laughs> fake smile. Come on, guys. That's not fake. Life is good. <laughs> okay. Um, we normally take our picture based on how we're feeling from the meetup, what we got from it. So does anyone have a suggestion? What kind of expression we should do? I'm like the exploding head. <laughs> like, that, that blew my mind. That's a good one. That's a good one. Yeah. Or the, th or the thinking face. The... Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. So which one you want to go with? Exploding head, thinking face. Anyone, just do it. I'm going to take the picture. Hmm. Colin wasn't ready. Okay, just... we, have to, we have to do it again. Colin was somewhere else just now. He was thinking about breakfast. It was like 7.30 in China right now. It's breakfast time. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, I took several of them. I don't know if you all have my print screen ding in, <laughs> but I realized my eyes were kind of closed down like Chinese. I'm like, you smiling too big, smiling too big, reel it back in. So, uh, do we I have any I'm more squinty. questions? I can't say that. And, uh, but my eyes are closed. Yeah, can't say that. Not 2021, you can't have that comment. Because of squinty eyes? Oh, okay. Yes. Okay, it's not like Chinese and it's like Asians. Yep. Is that all inclusive? You can't say that. Overall, you can't say that. <laughs> and, and, so now I know. Me, excuse me for just a moment. I'm going. I'm going to. Uh, I'm going to go off camera for just a second. I'm going to go and uh, if anybody else wants to join me, they can beverage themselves as well. <laughs> well, Mo Monique has a hand raised. She has a question. Oh, okay, Monique. Sorry. No, I'll wait till you come back. Okay. Cool. <laughs> Okay, so I will say that this officially ends. No, nope, we have seven more minutes. Sorry. We have seven more minutes before we officially end. So if anyone else wants to step away for a beverage, feel free. I have my bottle of water still here. And we'll come back and continue our discussion. But we're still recording for the next six minutes. So yeah. anyone... Yeah, Angie, uh -huh. when you when you do go forward with the scrum scrum master agile coaching, let me know because I'm I'm actively I'm working as an agile coach and trainer and whatnot. So I'd very much like to be part of that that um workshop. Okay, well I will definitely keep you informed. And Kenny Kenny can tell you guys how his certified scrum master exam was. While we're waiting. Yeah, very very so not not needing to, i can say the nerves or the expectation was greater than the exam i feel so realize that once you go over the material uh me personally I read the scrum guide say twice i already was familiar with it but i just read it over twice and once you read once you would have read and familiarized yourself with the information you would find that the uh, exam is very um somewhat casual in the approach in that not asking you things verbatim it's more or less multiple choice so once you have a familiarization with the scrum guide you're kind of good to go and the scrum guide is pretty much what 14 less than 20 pages yes. so you really trust me and i say it's one of those things where the fear is um bigger than the actual um exam itself so just that's what i, I keep saying the world yeah. is not flat yeah, just go for it the nice. world is round you know it's like yeah. we think that the world is flat and we build up our fail and we say wow you know this exam is going to be so complicated and then when you sit it and you finish it you're like where's the next page and i was like where's the next page are you working in scrum and agile right now if i'm if you mean my current job right uh, so when it comes to Agile in general, I kind of use it. I work in an uh, office environment, so realize a lot of things you can apply more or less ad hoc. Um, okay. So I, I apply it to my own life in general, not just work. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, yeah. it works out like that. Uh, 
I see Mr. Davis is back. I just had one quick question. Uh, well, well, can we use Monique, go to Monique first and then come well, back well, again? She had well, a hand he up. Can go, he can go ahead. Up. You want him to go, go ahead? ahead? He can go ahead. Oh, sorry. I didn't see. Sorry, Monique. Um, my quick question was as a rega in regards to uh, crypto, I know it's always been this. You mentioned about regulation. So I know um, Die Hard, crypto, uh, I mean, the community itself, they're not so much about regulation, but rather deregulation, DeFi, and everything else, because uh, the general consensus is that you want this free market, per se, where uh, the currency more or less yeah. is, you know, regulates itself. But naturally, that goes against banking and other, um, the structure of the world, I guess. Yeah. Um, so that battle, basically, how do you feel that there would ever be any like common ground or, or how would that play out in the long run, you feel? Yeah, that's, that's at the crux of that, that statement you know, that I read at the end by Meredith Broussard from Art Artificial Unintelligence, uh, is that there's almost this you know, I'm I'm just trying to think of what the you know what the what the Bahamian equivalent is to like Montana in the United States, where Montana is this place where, you know, everybody they believe that oh I I built this all myself I I I'm, I'm the I'm the king of everything I survey you can't tell me what to do uh, we value our freedom and our rights out here. Right. So you've got that, you know, so you got those people in Montana who do that. And even though it's, it's technically savvy people who've created this stuff, they have a lot of those kind of same beliefs. They believe that technology for the sake of tech is great and that they don't have any biases and that any system that they make doesn't have any biases in it, too. So they feel like, hey, uh, let's decentralize everything. Let's deregulate everything and let, you know, and just let let the let technology and the market drive everything. Um, I I you know it, it's it's great when you're not dealing with real world problems, but the moment that you start trying to deal with real world problems, those things don't work. If you if you really are if you really intend to be fair, if you intend to be inclusive, uh, those policies don't work. Um, in addition. Uh, people also have this thing about they don't want to pay taxes, right? Well, if the roads, you know, like if I say, hey, I, I don't want to pay taxes. Um, my school district is here. I don't want to pay taxes for somebody else's school district. Well, ignorance doesn't care about what school district that you're in. If you have somebody who's not educated as well living in the next county over, their ignorance is going to affect you. If you have bad roads in that county next to you, um, or in the neighborhood next to you, if an ambulance needs to get to your house and breaks a tire and busts a tire in that bad road, you know, it, all those things affect you. So, so the viewpoint that you just like that, that, you know, we want to be decentralized, we want to be deregulated, um, and we don't want to have anybody overseeing anything at all. Uh, you know, I, I, I think it's, I think, first of all, I think it will never happen. Um, I think it's doomed to, to failure if it does happen. I think the most likely scenario, and again, these are my opinions, I think that um, you're going to have some countries, you know, like, uh, like Venezuela, who, who embrace the use of cryptocurrency to replace their national currency, but the strong currencies in the world are never going to, they're never going to go for that. You know, they spent, they spent millennia building up this power base. And they're not going to give that up. Like that, that, that's never happened. Um, so, I mean, even in a place like Afghanistan with, with, the, with the Taliban, right? You feel like, oh, this will be a great place to have crypto, right? Um, and yes, there are some immediate benefits that you would see there. But ultimately, uh, a government has to have the power to tax its citizens in order to have common good. We don't like paying taxes. I don't want to pay more taxes than I have to. But I feel like those those two forces, um, first of all, the, the crypto anarchists are never going to win. But there's there's some there's some there's some area for loosening, I think, on the government side. Just again, just my opinion. Thank you. Yep. 
And now Monique. Pleasant good evening to everyone. And thank you, Larry, for your presentation. Um, I have two questions. Um, first question, what was the name that you gave for the decentralized loan pool? I'm interested in um, getting that information. Mm -hmm. Can you repeat that? Was it yes. Ava? Yes. So, so I say Ave, or it might be Ave. I'm going to put it in the chat. A-A-V-E. Okay. <laughs> thank um, you. And if you, if you give me a second, I will, I will give you the actual URL for it. Excellent. Um, yep. So that's, so it's, so it's a, it's decent. So decentralized finance or DeFi um, is, uh, is a, is a trend of using smart contracts uh, for a variety of financial instruments. Um, so, so Ave or Ave is used for, uh, for, is a protocol for doing loans. So you can basically, you could take your crypto, you can buy some crypto, um, you can, essentially, you know, lock it up inside of a smart contract with Ave, and um, you get, you know, guaranteed uh, payouts because of the smart contract protocol that's, you know, that's involved. Um, so as long as there are lenders, you know, there'll be payment. Um, and of course, Ave takes its, you know, cut or its slice off of that. But, you know, but, but it's still out there. It's a, it's a way for you to uh, you know, it's a way for you to park some of your crypto and 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 uh, you know make some money off it. Now, the, the 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 bad part is that that crypto is locked. It's not like you can just guarantee it or put it up and then use it. Although I'm pretty sure there are probably some places for where a you term, could, right? Well, uh, but uh, well, yes, your smart contract is for a term, right? Yeah. But 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 you know you know how there are um, what's it what's it called in stocks when you like buy a margin, right? I'm sure that there are DeFi houses that are letting people buy on margin, um, and uh, in financial terms, when you buy on margin, uh, um, well, yeah. I, if if you have more questions about buying on margin, we can we could go into that. But essentially, you're you're speculating on the direction of price a price of a stock will go, and you basically borrow against it. Um, that was what happened with GameStop. Um, if you remember, GameStop was people were saying GameStop was gonna do bad or the experts were saying it was gonna do bad. And then all the people who were kids at that time who loved the GameStop brand bought the stock and just kept driving the price up so that people who thought it was gonna go down lost money. <laughs> uh, so, you know, so, you know, they were buying a margin. Don't buy a margin for crypto. Just I would, don't do it. Yes, just, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I, it's, yeah I've don't, been investing, don't, yeah, yeah. I, I don't feel don't comfortable do with it. that, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, last question. Yes. Um, this master node um, option, I, I, I know mm -hmm. a company that's doing it, but I don't trust, uh, like you say, the white paper of the company and the legitimacy and mm -hmm. stability. However, I am interested in um, purchasing um, coins for a master node. Do you mm -hmm. have recommendations for sites that are legitimate or is that the X, XCZ? <laughs> um, <laughs> what is your company? <laughs> So, so again, remember, I'm, you know, I, I have a conflict of interest in recommending XCZ, so I'm not going to do that. Yeah, um, I, I was just being facetious. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but um, so let's say that you wanted to be a, a Dash masternode holder, right? Uh, so Dash is a coin um, that was one of the first like high security coins that are out there. Um, and so what you would do is you buy 1,000 Dash coins. Um, and you set up uh, you set up a server, and you hold those thousand coins on the server, and you participate in the Dash network protocol. So that means when a decision needs to be made about a transaction, you are one of the members who are voting on it uh, for whether it should be allowed or not. And so you receive rewards as a percentage of that transaction that's based on that. So if you didn't, so let's say that you wanted to do it, but you didn't trust Dash directly then what you could do is you could go to an exchange where Dash is sold and buy the coins and then set up the master node. So you don't have to buy it directly from the project uh, themselves. But I would also question the fact that if you don't trust the project, like if you don't trust the site or whatever, do you really want to be a master holder, master node holder on that network? Exactly. Mm -hmm. So if, if, if you're not liking what you're seeing, just move on. There are so many other projects you can choose from, right? And remember what I said, like about FOMO, right? Don't get caught up in that. You've got to make decisions that are disciplined 
based on what your interests are, what you, and, you know, what you want to, what you want to get out of that. Uh, the, the technology, whatever the coins are, you know, that's, that's second nature or second best, right? And yes, there are people who are millionaires in crypto, but I mean, that's like people who win the lottery, right? In reality, it's, you're grinding, it's a slow grind and you're looking for long-term value. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And again, I'm not a, I'm not a financial not a financial expert, folks. I'm just a guy who's who's made some mistakes. I'm also a you know owner of a, a co-founder of a of a of a brand uh, that's here. So I'm I'm totally willing to part impart knowledge though. Mr. Jackson has a question. Yes. Yeah, I I have to apologize for coming in late because I just came off the road. I couldn't log on on, on the road. Mm -hmm. My question is that I probably missed understanding your communication, but I still will ask it for clarity. Sometimes some questions are not too dumb, but you have to ask them. Am I understanding that you're saying that you can borrow money against crypto? Yes. With Aave, does you is reference Aave? Oh, it's the it's the, the it's the it's the protocol. So there's two. So 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 the fact that there's a smart contract means that the terms are locked in and guaranteed by the network. Okay. okay. All right. So, um, so what, so, so there is an intermediary step that would occur if you're going to use fiat basically, right? Because the protocol locks in the coins. So if those coins are made available or lent to someone else, uh, then they now have the ability to say, hey, I have this asset. It's like when you have your house, right? You mm -hmm. own a house, yeah. but really you have a mortgage. Like really the bank owns the house. They just let you stay in it. <laughs> but mm -hmm. you can use that mortgage that you have. You can use that house property, the value of it, to then go borrow, you know, make a home equity loan or something like that. It's the same principle that's there where the assets that they borrowed, that they guaranteed, those coins of yours that they borrowed are being used to leverage to do something else. So yes, so you can leverage the coins in the protocol to then get uh, fiat. Now you're not gonna get a really fantastic rate on it, but I mean, but you're, you're, you're probably not doing things like that because you're worried about fantastic, uh, fantastic rates. Um, and also, you know, the amounts that you're able to do, it's like with anything, you got to build up trust. You just can't walk in there and, and borrow a thousand ether on day one. <laughs> a thousand ether is probably trading what somewhere around what, like $2.5 million right now. <laughs> No, you don't expect to get that type of money. But you said the the facility to do that type of transaction. You said yes. that the, the .com does that. Uh, so they are the they are the protocol place. Like for at 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 Ave or at Av, you can do you can do the coin part. Now okay. you have to find somebody who will do the leverage. Will do the leverage part, but lot there uh, i'm i'm sure like i i'll just google it right now <laughs> but, but you know but that's 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 like the definition of high risk right <laughs> yeah because you know if, if the if the coin drops in value correct the, the lender loses money yes but the lender's not gonna, but, but the lender's not going to take that loss the lender's going to pass that loss on to the borrower <laughs> so that means you pay in interest plus loss. Correct. Larry, my question not was contract. not to That's lend, not a contract. but to borrow. Normally, normally, <laughs> normally I, I want to be clear. Normally, a contract means you sign on a given date on a given value. The person who's lending is actually taking the risk because he knows he can get an increase by leveraging. So now, if you have a loss on it, he makes you pay. That, that's like the housing market in the US. <laughs> <laughs> well, you gotta Sorry, consider, you but, but no, 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 it's it's great. No, no. First of all, we're we're we are in a forum where 
we are going to be, we should be candid. We should be completely out there. So in the U S housing market deserves the, deserves the criticism for sure. <laughs> okay. So, so first of all, second thing is that that's one of the biggest pitfalls of crypto right now, which is that it's volatile. Like it could go down in value 20% tomorrow. But if you, if you leverage yourself so that you can borrow $10,000 in fiat against, um, against 50 ether mm -hmm. and the value of the ether goes down to, you know, loses 20% of value, that you're, it doesn't matter. You're still on the hook for that addition, for that initial amount. You still got to pay back $10,000, even though, even though the ether isn't even worth $10,000. It's like, if you, if you, like you're saying with the housing market, if you, if you leverage your house and the value of your house goes down, well, guess what? You still got to pay back the value of that loan. They don't care that the value of your house went down and, and it's not, the, the bank is not going to be covering that. It's whoever borrowed the cash. You know, so, but again, you know, again, this, it's, it's, that's, that's some high risk maneuvers, right? So, you know, it's not going to be, you know, it's not going to be the, the uh, it's, it's not the first line of, credit for folks. But if you but if you own a lot of cryptocurrency or you're interested in leveraging cryptocurrency, it's a it's it's a fine way of doing it. If you have a business that relies on Ethereum for smart contracts, you might be using this protocol to, you know, to leverage deals so that you can make money, you know, like short term credit uh, if you're managing inventory in your store, right? Okay, thank you so much for that response. I hope that clarified your question, Mr. Jax. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's on target. I just thought it's strange that you have people doing that type of facility for crypto. I, I think it's strange that people take payday loans, but I, they do. <laughs> yeah, it happens. So we had 7.43 according to my computer time and 7.43 a.m. for Colin. So while he's starting his day, we are ending our day. But I would like to thank Dr. Larry Davis for an awesome presentation. The recording will be available sometime next week, whenever I get around to it. And I will update the community as usual with a post in our group to say the recording is available. And um, if Dr. Larry Davis wants to send me his slides, you can feel free because there are some persons who likes to recap and want to go over the slides. Okay. And I will do my part. I have my action items to check and see if there's anyone interested in that one day workshop and um, see how much, how much persons we have interested in that to let you know if that's a go or no. Okay. And um, yeah, I think that was all I put down as my action items. Okay. Uh, and should I use the PayPal to send that cash, or should I, uh, or should I register at the the event? Which one? Um, no, you can send it on. I went through the whole website. The website has a donation link that exactly. allows you to put any any amount in the donation link. But okay. the event itself is just going to take twenty five dollars for mm -hmm. you to get a Zoom link to participate mm -hmm. to attend okay. the event. So yeah, even though PayPal takes a chunk of our money, that's okay. We'll, we'll, we'll survive. So thank you so much for spending your time with us and for educating us just a little bit more. And I, I indeed appreciate learning and I'm sure that everyone else in the community enjoyed the session. And we meet again on the 9th of September where we will have our panel discussion featuring myself, uh, John Michael Clark and Sophia Walker discussing projects, everything about projects. So it's our one time to raise funds for the community this year, it's $25 investment to attend. The tickets are available on our website. So please make sure that you go and secure your tickets. We may be limiting space just so we could make it an interactive discussion and not so, you know, so many persons in attendance. So I urge you to go and get tickets as soon as you can. We are also accepting donations for the community through our website. So just so you know, go on our website, look at the pages. There are different pages. 
for creativemindsprojects.com. There is a page dedicated to our special project, which is the Bahamas Project Management Community that Creative Mind is sponsoring. We are in need of funding to continue this community. And so we're asking for your support. And thank you, Dr. Davis, for your pledge and your contribution towards our community, which we so appreciate, greatly appreciate. Thank you so much. You're very welcome, very welcome. And I think that's a wrap, guys. Good night, everybody. Good night, folks. Good night. Good night. Thanks to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great Good job. Night. Great job.